All right, welcome to today's lesson on the management of change. So change within organizations is inevitable, right? Things around us are changing all the time, and in order for companies to stay successful and relevant, they need a change with them. But that being said, it's often very difficult to manage change and ensure that your employees are willing to buy into the changes that are necessary for success. Um, effective change leadership must be forward-looking, proactive, and embracing of new ideas. It's very important that companies to be successful are being proactive and anticipating the change that's going to be required as opposed to reactive, which leaves them a step behind. A change leader in a company is anyone who takes responsibility for altering the existing pattern of behavior of either themselves or other people or the social system as a whole. Because today's business environment is so dynamic and is constantly changing, all managers in a company must be constant change leaders to keep up with that pace. Now there's a variety of sources for change within a company. Uh, it can be created either by internal or external forces. Internal forces arise when a change in one area in the company causes you to have to change another part of that company. So for example, if we're going to release a new product, we might have to make changes in our marketing department and the way we market our products and brand ourselves in order to reflect that change. Change can also be a result of external forces, which can come from a variety of, uh, of sources. It could be the result of globalization, uh, market competition changing, which means that we have to change with it, the economic changes, uh, political change, right, where we have to respond to the environment that's created by that new pol uh, pol political environment, which may bring in new laws and regulations, or some technological developments, and sometimes just the social values of the community around us or our consumers or the stakeholders in a company might change, causing us to have to change with them. Now, there's two types of change we can have. We have either top-down or bottom-up change. Top-down change is driven by the organization's top leadership. This is strategic and comprehensive. It's an overall goal. Uh, we're going to take the overall goal and change it to face a new direction for the entire organization. The success of this type of change depends on the support of middle-level and lower-level workers. The more we can get them to buy into that change, the better success we're going to have. Incidentally, it's often very rare that large-scale changes like this are successful in companies in North America. In fact, there's statistics that show 70% um, of large-scale changes end in failure. The other type of change we have is bottom-up change. So this comes from any and all parts of the organization. It doesn't have to be the frontline worker, the operative. It could be frontline managers, it could be middle managers, and so on. It just means that it's not necessarily coming from top management. And this is made possible in a company by offering empowerment for employees. It's allowing them participative planning, right, where they can take part in some of that planning where the company is going. They're involved with the major decisions that company makes. This type of change occurs organically within the organization and is in response to emergent trends that are happening in the industry. It's crucial to have this for organizational innovation that is prompt and keeps with the times. Often this takes much more time than top-down change because it occurs naturally instead of someone just setting the direction as a whole, but it is often much more accepted and much more successful. In fact, many companies that are successful use a combination of top-down and bottom-up change, where the change comes naturally through using the bottom-up strategy coming from empowerment of our employees, and then as soon as that starts happening, top management or upper management seizes on this and then implements policies to promote that change using a top-down strategy to make sure the whole company moves forward together. Now there are a number of things that we can try and change within a company. It could be the tasks, which is the nature of work being performed itself. It could be the people, we're trying to change their attitudes and competencies of our employees. The culture, or the overall value system of our organization as a whole. Sometimes we want to change the technology that's being used to support our workers in their jobs, or we might just be changing the structure or organization of the company as a whole. Change can have different scopes. So, we can have um, transformational change or incremental change. Transformational change is that large-scale change that we're trying to make an overall change in direction of our company. Incremental change is when we're adjust, ad, adjusting um, existing systems and practices, just making small changes here and there. It's important that good managers are always striving for plan change. We're, we're looking to do this in advance of things that are happening instead of being reactive. This plan change is based on response to performance gaps. So what we think we're going to be at or where we want to be at doesn't necessarily line up with where we are actually at within a company. Now all change happens in a variety of stages. There's three stages that happen uh, one after the other. The first stage is unfreezing. 
This is when uh, we're trying to discover that we, we realize we have to make a change and we start preparing our employees for that change. We start educating them as to why we think that change is necessary, um, why it's important, and making sure that they, they understand what we're trying to do. This is probably the most important phase of this and it's often cut short in many companies and advancing onto the actual change. And as a result of that, the companies aren't willing or the employees aren't willing to buy into that change and it doesn't become as successful. The second stage is the actual changing stage where we implement the new system that we want our employees to follow. Okay? And we make sure that they try and, uh, follow those particular systems. And then finally we have the refreezing stage. So after we've developed and put those in, in initiated that change in the company, uh, we want to make sure that it becomes part of their actual habit. It becomes part of their daily routine. And during this refreezing stage, it's important that we keep up as much um, support systems as a manager as possible for as long as possible to make sure that they really adapt and buy into that change. And there are four strategies, sorry, there's three strategies that we can use to help um, get our employees to actually take on that change and start changing the way they do things. The first is called the force coercion strategy. And this is actually the one that is probably the easiest to do, um, but produces the most limited and temporary results of the three different strategies. In this strategy, we're using our power base of legitimacy, rewards, and punishments to induce that change. In other words, I'm your boss, and I will reward you with benefits or bonuses or whatever, or I'll punish you with the threat of being fired or demoted if you do this change. Okay? It relies on the belief that people are motivated by self-interest. So to adapt this strategy, managers would find out what is it that interests or concerns their employees, and then they put pressure on those interests and concerns to make sure they get what they want out of their employees. Many times this is combined with political maneuvering, right? They put that pressure on their employees and they use those threats and if they get them to do a certain thing, then they can move forward on in their particular careers. They try and do this to gain advantage over others. But again, the success of this is limited and only produces temporary results as long as those punishments and, and threats of punishments and rewards are in place. The second type of strategy we have is rational persuasion strategy. So in this sense, we're going to try and convince our employees that this particular change is important and necessary. It involves bringing about change through persuasion backed by special knowledge, data, and rational argument. So the empirical data is an expert in the field says, listen, this is the way things need to be in order for us to be, I don't know, more successful or be able to create more product or whatever it is that we're trying to change. Okay, we bring in that expert power to show us how that's important. Um, because we are able to rationalize this and make employees believe this, uh, it produces longer lasting and internalized change that is more accepting. And the third type of change is the shared power strategy. And this comes back to more of a 21st century style management idea. And it's the idea that um, people are going to respond to social cultural norms and expectations of others. If they are involved in the planning and they're including everybody in this and the norm is that everyone's accepting it and willing to move forward in it, then they're more likely to be willing to buy into that change themselves. Okay? We want to identify the values and the goals that our companies, uh, that our employees have, which will support that change happening. It involves others in examining the social culture factors related to the issue at hand and relies on strong interpersonal skills. We're all working together. We're all in this together. We're working moving forward as a company. It's much more time consuming to build this type of environment, but it's likely to he uh, yield a much higher commitment to that because, again, the employees are feeling empowered and they're feeling involved in that particular decision. Now, there's a number of reasons that people in companies and in life in general will resist change. Um, one of them is the fear of the unknown. If we don't know how things are going to go, we're afraid of that. We want to know how things are going to be. Change often disrupts our habits, which makes it difficult for us to do this. And anything that is more difficult, we don't like doing. Um, sometimes change can cause people to lose confidence. They think, well, if I have to change the way I'm doing it, is that because I'm not good enough at my job? Am I not doing it properly? What happens if I can't do it well enough, right? Um, a loss of control because they're being forced to make this change. They're not in control of the way things are being done. Sometimes it's poor timing for the change because maybe we're being overloaded by work. If we're already busy, having to take more time to do something until we learn how to do it properly can be very difficult. Um, sometimes it's a loss of face that goes with the loss of control or confidence, right? If somebody's making you change something, it's, oh my goodness, I must have done something wrong. People, How are people looking at me type of thing? And the other common reason people resist change is because they think there's no purpose to it. They're like, what's the point? It's not going to do anything for us. 
we can deal with these resistances by a number of different solutions. The first is by educating our employees, making sure that they're aware of the change and why that change is important. We need to communicate uh, to them so they are understanding what's going on. The second we saw previously, which was to make them participate and involved in those decisions and in the change itself. If we can find somebody to help us promote that change to other employees and get them to buy into it, that's great. Um, offering facilitation and support. If they know that they are supported in this uh, this time where we're going through this change and upheaval, they're more likely to buy into it, right? They know that they have something to fall back on and they're not being held out on a limb. Um, facilitation and agreement. Make it, helping to make sure that those employees are going to agree with the change and why it's happening. Um, sometimes we can use manipulation um, or we can use cooperation right? Uh, sometimes if you manipulate people into doing it, it's maybe not going to produce the best change results, but it can make sure that they are uh, making some sort of change, right? Especially for people who are highly, highly resistant to that change. And then we can also use the explicit and implicit coercion. We can coerce people and sort of, again, force them to do it. That's that original strategy that we saw before where we're using our power to force people to change. Again, not ideal, but if our other methods aren't working, this is a strategy that we can employ. That's it. That's all we have time for today. We'll see you in class tomorrow where we can practice what we've learned.